Welcome on this first Sunday of Advent. This morning I first want to call our attention to the flowers to my left. They are in honor of children uh, and grandchildren. And they, those children are Dominique, Lauren, Riley, and Emerson Osella. And then Ed and Harmony and Jude and Aria Hendrick. And they're given with love by Keith and Melanie Osella. Once again, we are glad to have those who are present with us in worship, as well as those who continue to watch us uh, online and join us in that way. Those upon our prayer list continue to make progress, and so we ask that you continue to remember them. The good news is we had no additional people to go to the hospital this week, and so continue to pray for those. With all of that being said, begin with these words. In the season of prophecy and promise and preparation, we come to be renewed and refreshed. Inspired by stories of a Messiah who will change the world and change us. We come to listen for words of hope and joy, promise and challenge. We come with open ears, open minds and open hearts. We come to receive the blessings God has in store for us. In this season of waiting, come, let us worship our God, the one who brings all things into fulfillment. time for celebrating Christ's birth. We are here because God's promises to our ancestors came true when Jesus was born. God's promise is kept each Sunday when we worship because Christ is in our midst. God will keep the promise to come again in glory. Our scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah 60 verse 2. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you, and God's glory will be seen upon you. We light this candle to proclaim the coming of the light of God into our darkness. With the coming of this light, there is hope. Because of Christ, we not only have hope, but we believe that the good is stronger than evil. God wants us to work for good in this world.
join with me as we pray? O oh God, it is with great anticipation that we gather on this first Sunday of Advent. We thank you, O oh God, that when the world believed that there was no hope, that your Son, Jesus Christ, came into our world, wrapped up in flesh, and dwelt among us. Even at that time, he brought hope into the world. The world still did not recognize it. As time moved forward, as we will see today as we worship, as Christ lived, as he was crucified and resurrected, that that hope became a reality not only to the world, but that hope became a reality to all who place their faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you, O oh God, for the wonderful feelings that the season of Advent brings to our life. Feelings of waiting, expectation, anticipation. We ask now, O oh God, that you bring us close, not only to the cradle of Christ, but also to the foot of the cross. And this day, may we see that Jesus, the Son of God, was truly the Savior of the world. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and all the other Christmas songs to come. So this morning, I hope you will. 
That first Christmas was filled with irony, the irony of a king in a feeding trough with ordinary shepherds who worship while the greatest religious leaders did not know he had been born of a poor young couple entrusted with the care of the only begotten Son of God. Good morning, everyone, and to uh, all our UK fans watching, go Gators. Uh, it is Advent, Advent season, and so um, for today's lesson, I made us a clock. Now, I don't know if they still do this, but when I was a kid in elementary school, we had an entire sec section of curriculum dedicated to reading an analog clock. And I remembered it so well that I had to look up which hands tell what part of the time right before I came up here. Um, <clears throat> but if you don't know, the short hand is the hour and the long hand is the minute. And it, it's e pretty easy to read time like this where the short hand is straight up and the long hand is straight down would be 1230. Um, and through this clock, our, most of our day is organized, probably by your parents. Uh, for me, my wife pretty much keeps my clock, um, or Steve. But you know, probably around 12, it'll be lunchtime, right? 
Um, in my house, it's around seven, but for most people, and this is falling apart, expert craftsmanship by me. Um, six would be dinner time. But what if we flipped it around? You might be able to tell when it's straight up and down that that's either 12 or 6, right? But as we start moving about, then it's just a guess. And now it's falling apart. Which is a perfect segue to the point that I'm about to make. Advent, by its definition, um, is something big is coming. Like if you look up Advent in Merriam-Webster or whatever they call dictionaries, uh, it stands for a big thing is coming, something awesome. And during Advent, we talk a lot about Jesus' birth because our Lord and Savior came, and it was awesome. But um, the Bible says that someday he will return, and we don't know the time, and we'll never know the time on this clock anymore because it doesn't work, or the day, or anything about it. We just wait patiently for our Savior to return someday. Let us pray. Dear God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to gather here. Um, during this Advent season, may we be thankful that um, for our Lord and Savior, and may we be mindful and be patiently waiting for his return someday. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to offer a special thanks to all who come last Sunday afternoon and helped us put out all the Christmas apparel that our church wears during the season of Advent. A special thanks to all of those people, and you know who you are. And also a special thanks to all of those who faithfully and diligently work on the lights on our outside ground. At the end of worship today, there will be a responsive reading, and we will dedicate those lights. Normally, we would have a service festival of lights and finger foods and things like that, but not this year. But tonight at 4.30, our lights will come on, and they will burn all the time during the season of Advent all the way up to Epiphany, which is the 6th of January. And so we want to thank all of those who made that possible because there are so many things in the church that go on behind the scenes and you walk in and, and you see all of these things uh, just have been done well they get done by people who faithfully serve God and do them and we are grateful for that our scripture reading this morning you probably think coming out of the gospel of John the 18th chapter the 33rd verse, we're over toward the end of the gospel, but I will connect it to the beginning of the gospel. If you were here with us this morning, you could see that there is a cross there with a star right at the center point with a beam's cross. And during the season of Advent, we will be doing a series of sermons out of the gospel of John on gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and then also on the 20th, swaddling clothes. With that being said, I'd like to read our text coming from John 18, verse 33. Pilate then went back, back inside the palace and summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Do you think I am a Jew? And Pilate replied, It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now, my kingdom is from another place. 
You are king then, Jesus, then, then said Pilate. And Jesus answered, You are right in saying that I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this cause I came into the world to, fest, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, Pilate asked. With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shout back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you this day not only for the hearing and the reading of God's word. But in this season of Advent, O oh God, we pray now that you will help us put those words into practice. And may all the meditations of our hearts and the words of thy servant find acceptance in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. For it's in his holy name we humbly pray. Amen. During this Advent season, we're going to be looking at the cradle. And we're going to do it by looking through the lens of the cross. And we're going to see that the three gifts that the wise men brought to the birth of our Savior, gold, frank, and sense, and myrrh. These three gifts represent signposts of what Jesus came to do but they also represent three confrontations that occur near the end of Jesus' life. Goal is the confrontation with Jesus being the king of the Jews, where he's confronted by Pontius Pilate. I don't know what you want it to be, but when I was growing up, I always wanted to be a TV host on a television show. And the one that I loved as a child was Family Feud, which I still watch to this day. It was a show that made you think about what other people were thinking. And I remember one time the host of the Family Feud, which was Richard Dawson at that time, said, when someone mentions the word king, to whom or she are they referring to? What would your answer be? Think about it. Well, bing, clean, the answers appear. Eighty-one people out of a hundred said Elvis Presley. God and Jesus was the second answer with seven. Martin Luther King had three, and Burger King got two. Okay, let's be honest out there. How many of you thought the king, how many of you thought Elvis Presley? But you know in the church, the number one answer should have been Jesus. We can't just seem to help ourselves, though. What about all of this says is that when we think of a king, we can't help importing what our understanding of, of a king is at that moment. If you stop and think about it, America was founded upon the principles of the divisions of government, so we're kind of suspicious of kings. We don't think anybody should have that much power and we worry about the corruption of leadership. And yet still in Europe, there are a lot of people who still have kings. And many of those kingdoms are ceremonially only in power. It's more like symbolic power than it is actual leadership. And there are others that are still under the oppression of kings. So when we hear the Bible describe Jesus as a king, we bring certain sets of assumptions to the table. 
So what I hope we'll discover together today is, is that when the Bible talks about Jesus as a king, what does it really mean by that? Remember I said earlier that gold is a signpost that Jesus is the king of kings. And our scripture is about the confrontation that Jesus is about to have with Pontius Pilate, who is, this, who is Caesar's representative in that area of the country. And you need to know that for Pontius Pilate, you caught it in the text, for him, truth is negotiable. Facts are flexible. And he would do whatever it took to stay in control. Justice to him was just a matter of who's in charge. I want you to imagine with me for a moment the dark inside of a jail cell. There's somebody who's in that jail cell. He's a life taker. He's a criminal. He's completely guilty. And for him, there's no appeal process. There's nothing else to be done but for him to wait the execution that is to come. And in the solitude of that jail cell, you could imagine for him the like of hope, the weight of despair. But to his surprise, the soldiers come in and he figure, figures he's on his way to be killed. But instead of treating him like they had before, they unlock his chains. They open the door, and they invite him to run outside. He almost at first thinks this is a joke or some kind of trick, but he knows he's not going to get another chance. So he does what most criminals would do. He begins to run, and after a couple of blocks, and after making a couple of turns, he leans over, and his legs are very winded. And he breathes deep, and he hides in the shadows. And he thinks to himself, what has just happened? Why me? You can imagine that this must have been like what the experience was like for Barabbas in the Bible. Because you see, in this day, it was the custom at Passover for someone to be let go. But Pilate, no less times, if you read the entire text, no less than four times, Pilate tries to get them to let Jesus go, who is set to free. But instead, Barabbas is let go. And how could Barabbas but think to himself, why was I set free? Well, way back in the Bible, it describes things all the way back going to the time of Moses. And you see at this Passover celebration, it is known as a substitutionary sacrifice. And I like the way one scholar describes what that is. He said, all real life changing love is costly, substitutionary sacrifice. It is where one person takes the place of another person. And it's a costly trade. You see, it's something that we're quite familiar with if we stop and think about it. It is something that still deeply moves us when someone is willing to take the place of another. Whenever we think about literature or even the books or the movies that were written about the Hunger Games, we know how that famous star, Candace Everdeen, she volunteers to take the place of her sister in those barbaric games. The same thing happens in the books of Harry Potter. And if you've noticed, there's something that is within us happens 
when someone is willing to lay down their life for another. And there's that part of us. We can relate to the fact that a sister is willing to trade her place for another. We can relate to the fact that a parent is willing to lay down their life for a child. But here, Jesus is qualitatively different from any of those people. Because Jesus is king. And he's trading his life for a criminal. He's Lord. He's Lord, yet he is substituting his life for a servant. I don't know about you, but it's almost impossible for me to wrap my imagination around that kind of trade. This is why Jesus in the confrontation with Pilate says, my kingdom is not of this world. And if you stop and think about it, going back to the beginning when Jesus began his ministry, he began by saying, repent, which means turn around, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And from then on, all throughout the course of his ministry, we get to see what all of that is like. The blind begin to see, the lame begin to walk, the deaf begin to hear. People are healed and people are brought back from the dead. This kingdom that Jesus ushers in is unlike any kingdom in history. It brings renewal and restoration. As Jesus says in the text, it's a kingdom that originates from another place. And so when this dialogue between Pilate and Jesus occurs, Pilate asks the question that everybody has been wanting to ask their whole life. Are you really the king of the Jews? I love how John Ortberg describes his answer. He said it must have been an intensely dramatic moment Because Jesus may still go free if he just says no. If he will assure Pilate that he's no threat to Caesar. But Ortberg says, yet while this question hung over Jesus' entire ministry, ironically, any day before that, all Jesus would have to have said is, yes, I am the Messiah. And if he had only said that, a good portion of Israel would have risen up and they would have died for Jesus. As recently as Palm Sunday, that chance laid openly before him. And yet he would never claim the title. And now when there are no crowds around him to rally... When he's in the hands of Pilate and there's no chance of any army rising to defend him, when there's no chance of him being misinterpreted as a military figure, now when it's too late for him to be saved, Jesus says, yes, yes, it's me. I am who you say. I'm the one you have been waiting for. I am their king. And as soon as Jesus says that, he knows exactly what is going to happen to him. And Pilate pronounces the sentence. But it's in this moment, beloved, that Jesus reveals who he really is. One of the saddest chapters in Israel's history is this. And why would I say that? Let me give you a little background on this moment that has just occurred. The moment when they clamor in the Old Testament. Remember, they clamored. Jesus, 
they clamored, God, give us a king. And you see, up until that point, the rabbis had taught the people. And the people prayed and chanted together and they would say, We have no king but God. All the other kingdoms of the world, but we have God. And so can you imagine how much it broke God's heart in that time when they absolutely, they demanded a king. They wanted to be like all the other nations of the world. And so God being who he is, God gives them a king. And we know the story, sometimes they have a decent one and sometimes, most of the time, they had bad ones. And it did not end well. And here, you know, we have Israel now is under a foreign occupation. And here, Pilate goes before them. In chapter 19, he asked them, Shall I crucify your king? And do you know what the people of God said? We have no king but Caesar. What began at the beginning of the Christmas story, do you remember it? In those days went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This was what was about to happen at the time of Caesar. And now, not only has it about to happen, at the end of Jesus' life, they pledge their loyalty and their allegiance to Caesar. The people who had centuries before chanted, We have no king but God. Now chant, we have no king but Caesar. And what they've done is they have surrendered to a new kind of king. Several years ago, they discovered a stone. And it was a stone about this size. And inscribed in that stone were the Greek letters that said these words, that Caesar is king and God's son. And that's exactly how Caesar, with his ego, wanted others to view him. But if I could show you the stone, and you can go and look it up, if you look very, very closely at that stone, someone has chiseled something in those words that says Caesar is king and God's son. It must have been an early Christian, but in the form of graffiti, they chisel out a cross. And right over the words of Caesar is king and God's son is a cross chiseled over the top of that. Because the early Christians believed that there was only one king. There's only one true son of God. And his name is Jesus. I wonder if we had been alive in, as early Christians, if we would have had that kind of courage when it comes to our faith. I wonder as well, I wonder if we could really be that honest about our allegiance. That I have no king but success. I have no king but ambition. I have no king but the approval of others. I have no king but status. I wonder where my real allegiance would lie. I wonder if the cross 
would have been chiseled upon my heart in the same way that it was that stone. There is a famous artist by the name of Gibbs Singleton. He began doing restoration work in his early career. But toward the end of his life, his daughter died. And at the same time, he learned he himself did not have long to live. All of a sudden, everything became supremely clear to him. And he was finally able to see for the first time in his life what he had been called to do with his hands. Always a gifted artist. But he turned his giftedness to devotional Christian art. And one of the last works that he does is a station of the cross. And I want Jeff to put it on the screen. And what that is entitled is Behold Your King. Look closely at it. Can you see the sign above Jesus' head? And I wonder if you're willing to take a few moments of personal meditation with me as we look at that piece of art. For that's what a real king looks like. Here he is. Here is your king. Not something that we would have imagined. Doesn't align up with our understanding. But behold your king. You know, I said earlier, it's easy for us to imagine a sister willing to lay down her life for another sibling. It's easy for us to imagine a parent being willing to lay down their life for a child. But the most remarkable thing about today's scripture story, and I don't want you to miss it at all, it's a little detail that everyone who heard this story for the first time would have known exactly what it said. But we just, we miss it. Remember I told you at Passover, a substitution happens. A king takes the place of a criminal. And the criminal's name is Barabbas. And you know what Barabbas means? Son of the Father. Jesus died so that we might become children of God. Oh, it's one thing to die for a family member that you already love. It's another thing to have the kind of love that makes someone an heir, a child a son, a daughter of the one true God. And so you see, Jesus, he is king. But he's no ordinary king. His kingdom is not of this world, but I am here to declare to you that his kingdom is for this world. And he has come into this world to make a costly trade, an incredible substitutionary sacrifice. And so during this season of Advent, especially on this first Sunday of Advent, 
know that the Lord of all, he was willing to become the kind of king that he knew he was to be in order for all of us to become his child. Who would ever have imagined? Let us pray. Our loving God and Father, we confess that our true allegiances are often elsewhere. Like the Israelites of long ago, the crowds clamoring before Jesus, we are willing to surrender to other authorities and powers. And so we confess to you right now, God, that in this moment, those real allegiances and kinships that we have. But Lord, we also confess that we don't have an accurate picture or imagination of what a king is. For we think of the power, the glory, and the majesty. And so often we forget your version of a kingdom, a kingdom that is upside down. And that you came, O oh God, not to be served, but to serve and to offer your life as a ransom in taking our place before God. That we might become sons and daughters of you. Chisel on our hearts the cross, O oh God, so that we might see the cradle of the Christ child for what it really is. The beginning of being adopted by you. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hopefully, as we continue over the next few weeks, you continue to see and look at the cradle of the Christ child. Look at it through the lens of the cross. Because how do you separate the incarnation from his life, crucifixion, death, and resurrection? For remember when the scriptures are written, they're never just little bits written in isolation. But they continue unfolding the story as we read them. Who would have ever imagined that Jesus was willing to become this kind of king for you and me. I invite you this morning to continue to meditate. Go home and if you have, Google what you do. Just type in Gibson Singleton, Behold Your King. And you'll see, that'll be the first picture that'll pop up. And then you'll see all the other art that he painted before his death. I invite you now, as we stand and unite our voices together and sing, O oh, worship the King.
we're going to dedicate our lights. It is a responsive reading. With joyful hearts, O oh Lord, we give you thanks for Christmas. The birth of Christ is a beacon of light that guides our lives, no matter how dark our night. With Christ as our guide, we are no longer afraid to live our lives in the open where people can see us. Christ gives us hope to go on when things seem the darkest. But most importantly, Christ teaches us to view one another with eyes of love so that we are able to create harmony where disunity and distrust would otherwise be. God grant us the grace of Christmas so that our lives may be a beacon of light to our brothers and sisters in the community of Bowling Game, Green. And may all who experience the witness of the true light, Jesus Christ, come to know the hope, peace, joy, and love of Christmas. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we bow in your presence in this moment, realizing that Jesus is the light of the world. And that many years ago, when this church began the tradition of its grounds wearing Christmas apparel and lights and displaying the nativity. They did it not so it would draw attention unto us, but they would burn as a beacon and a light to all who drove up and down Campbell Lane. We rededicate them this God, O oh God, this year to you and pray that they will honor and glorify you. And as we continue our celebration of Christmas, may the light of Christ continue to burn brighter in all of our lives. For it is in Christ's holy name we pray. Now as our acolyte comes, our responsive benediction. The time is coming when God will call us to account. Be alert, watchful, serving faithfully day by day. We will look around us for signs of God's presence. We will open our eyes to ways to be helpful. Use the gifts you have been given to the glory of God. Let the testimony of Christ strengthen you in every way. We will share our spiritual gifts in word and in deed. We will seek to be shaped by the potter's hands. Grace to you and peace from God and Jesus Christ. Know that God is faithful and Christ walks with you. With hearts full of gladness, we will do what is right. With great joy, our lives will show forth our faith. Amen. Also, before you depart, beginning today, you may have already noticed, there is a different church member writing an Advent devotional each day during the season of Advent. It will post at 10 a.m. in the morning. It will post on the Bowling Green Cumberland Presbyterian Church's Facebook page because Jeff has to post it, but they will also post on our website. Also, remember today, I was quite touched by the creative way the David Lindsay family didn't write theirs. They made a video. Be sure that you watch it. Go in love and go in peace.